everybody. Today we're starting our new unit on DNA, and we're going to start with chapter 16, the molecular basis of inheritance. So this unit, we're basically going to talk about what DNA is, why it's important, who discovered it, the structure of DNA, and then um, how DNA makes proteins. Uh, and we all know that proteins are really important because they're the building blocks of us. Um, so we're going to start with chapter 16 and then work our way through. So DNA um, basically has all of the instructions that you need to make you. Um, in the 50s, these two guys, James Watson and Francis Crick, they basically figured out the structure of DNA, um, which is a double helix. And a double helix is just basically a twisted ladder. Um, and DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. So DNA has all of the blueprints to make us who we are, to make every organism, plants and animals, who we are. Uh, it has our hereditary information. It's in every single one of our cells in our bodies. Uh, and it basically just has the information to make our traits. So... The beginning of this chapter, we are going to talk about the experiments that kind of led the scientific world to understand that DNA is the hereditary uh, carrier um, and what it is and, you know, what it looks like. So we're going to talk about those experiments today. It was a big challenge back in the early 20th century because they didn't have the technology that we had. Uh, they didn't have the understanding that we had. Um, and most people thought that the genetic information was in proteins because proteins are the building blocks of all life. So we actually had to discover what DNA was. So um, to figure out that DNA was our hereditary um, material, they, the scientists studied bacteria and viruses that infect them. So... This guy, Frederick Griffith, um, he also worked with a person by the last name Avery. He worked with pneumonia. Okay, he worked with this bacteria, Streptococcus pneumoniae. And um, it causes pneumonia in mammals. And he worked with two different types of bacteria. He worked with a pathogenic strain, which means that it's very uh, harmful, it makes you sick, and then a non pathogenic strain. Um, and you can probably guess what that means, that, it, you know, it infects you, but it's not, it's not really as harmful to you. So, what Griffith did, he injected four um, different groups of mice with the different strains of this bacteria. So, the first strain, he injected with the pathogenic bacteria, the ones that were harmful to mammals, and all of the poor little mice in that strain when he injected them, they died. Okay. Um, the second strain, what he did was he he basically took the non-pathogenic strain, the one that was not harmful but it was still alive, and he injected all the mice with that, and they were all fine. Okay. And then the third strain that he did, he took the pathogenic or the harmful strain, and he killed them with heat. So the deadly bacteria was killed with heat. They were all fine. That totally makes sense because, well, the bacteria were dead. Um, so they were totally fine. But the fourth um, group of mice that he injected was a little bit curious because he took the live non-harmful strain, okay, so the non-pathogenic strain, he took that, and he mixed it together with the dead uh, killed by heat pathogenic strain and then the interesting information that he found from that was that those mice actually died Okay, so what the heck was going on with that? so um, Basically what they did when they found the blood uh, when they looked at the blood in the mice he saw that there was live Harmful bacteria in it. So he was like what the heck is going on there? So he called this phenomenon transformation Okay, and all that is is a change in genotype, okay, and phenotype, so what you see, so a change in the genes and a change in what you see, uh, because basically the DNA was taken in or assimilated by the cell, okay. 
Okay, so, um, <clears throat> additional evidence for DNA being the genetic material came from studies of viruses that infect bacteria. So we're going on to our next experiment now. All right, so these little guys right here, you've probably seen them before on like Jimmy Neutron or something. These guys are called bacteriophages. So the green things on this screen are viruses. Uh, and what they do is their host cells are actually bacteria. They're not really, they're not people, they're not animals. So their host cells are bacteria. And they are used as tools uh, a lot by genetic researchers because we can actually see them. So this is an actual picture. And this brown part at the bottom is the cell. And these green things are the bacteriophage viruses. And as you can see, these little weird tail things going into the cell, they're actually infecting their host. So viruses are actually, um, they're really weird because they're not technically living because they can't reproduce without a host. They're only made of a couple parts. This part right here, the green part, is called a protein coat. So it's made of proteins. And then inside there is DNA. So viruses are really only made of proteins in DNA, and that's important to know for this next experiment. So Alfred Hershey and Martha Chase, they worked with these bacteriophage viruses, and they performed experiments showing that DNA is the genetic material um, of the phage known as T2. So they worked with the bacteriophage virus known as T2, and then they figured out from this experiment that we're about to talk about that um, viruses transmit DNA, that DNA is genetic material. So basically what they did was they, um, they let two different sets of viruses infect these bacteria. So remember I said that viruses are only made of proteins and DNA. That's it. So what they did was they took some radioactive stuff Okay, radioactive. And in the first group, they made the protein of the virus, the protein coat radioactive. All right, just the protein. They left the DNA alone. So when the bacteria was infected by these viruses with the radioactive protein, they were fine. They weren't radioactive. Well, they were infected, but they didn't, weren't radioactive. And then the second group of uh, viruses... What they did was they made the DNA radioactive. Okay, so the second group, the DNA was radioactive, not the protein coat. The protein coat was fine. So in the second group of viruses, when they let them infect their host cell, what was really cool is that now the host cell was radioactive. So they were like, oh my goodness, well, we, we know what DNA is, but we didn't know that it was the genetic material. But we know that viruses live on by infecting their genetic material into host cells. So they figured out from this experiment that viruses inject DNA, which is the hereditary material, and that's how they continue to um, be viruses, make more viruses. So prior to the 50s, like I said, um, we already knew a little bit about DNA. We just had no clue that it was the genetic material. We knew that DNA was a polymer, and a polymer just means a chain, okay, so a chain of stuff. Um, a polymer of nucleotides is what DNA is made of, it's nucleotides. And these nucleotides have three parts, okay, and this is important to know because it's on every um, EOC, on every AP test. It's just you got to know the three parts of a nucleotide. So the three parts of a nucleotide are a nitrogenous base, okay, which is these light green, dark green, lightish orange, and then dark orange things over here, nitrogenous base, a sugar, okay, and then a phosphate group. So the sugar and the phosphates are over here. So and we call the sugar and the phosphate put together the sugar phosphate backbone. So here's a phosphate, here's a sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar. And as you can see, for every phosphate, every sugar, there's a nitrogenous base. So there was another really important experiment that happened uh, by this guy named Erwin Chargaff, all right? And 
what he did was he looked at DNA samples from a bunch of different organisms. Okay. Um, in 1947, he reported, he said that DNA is different from one species to the next. Well, that definitely makes sense. That's why we're so different. Uh, and there was evidence of molecular diversity among all of the different species. Okay. And then, so this made it more credible that DNA was the genetic material because obviously we're all so different um, than us having different DNA would make sense. So once all these experiments happened uh, and biologists and scientists were convinced in the scientific community that DNA actually was our genetic material, we had to figure out how DNA structure um, could actually account for or help uh, in its role for our heredity, for our inheritance. So this guy and this lady, um, Maurice Wilkins and Rosalind Franklin, they work together to um, basically take a picture of DNA. They use this technique called X-ray crystallography to study the structure of DNA. Okay, an X-ray crystallography, this is the picture they took right here. Um, it's exactly what it sounds like using like X-ray techniques um, to figure out and take pictures of small molecular things. Um, so Rosalind Franklin, she actually took a picture, this one on the right, this was her picture, using x-ray crystallography, okay? She had no idea what it was. She kind of set it to the side. She was like, okay, that's cool. I don't know what it is. And then um, years later, Watson and Crick found this picture, and they looked at it, and they were like, oh my gosh, okay, it kind of looks like... Um, a, like a spiral staircase if you're looking at it from the top okay and from Rosalind Franklin's picture they figured out that DNA okay they figured out the structure of DNA um, is in the form of a double helix now um, so basically what Franklin concluded was that DNA was too anti-parallel phosphate backbones and anti-parallel means that we got one backbone going one way another backbone going the other way please google anti-parallel if you have no idea what the heck I'm talking about um, they run opposite of each other but they're parallel and then it's made of nitrogenous bases well from the picture a couple slides ago we saw that DNA had the sugar phosphate backbone and then nitrogenous bases and then they're stuck together and then the four nitrogenous bases in DNA are adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine, or A, T, C, and G. Okay, so this is DNA. This is what it looks like on a molecular level. You can kind of see that it is in the shape of a ladder. It looks a little bit awkward, but it is in the shape of a ladder. Here's a rung or a step. Here's another one. Here's another one. Here's another one. And what makes up the sides of the ladder is the sugars and the phosphates. So we have a sugar phosphate backbone, we have another sugar phosphate backbone, and then we have the nitrogenous bases in the middle. Okay, And as you can see, they run anti-parallel to each other, which just means one goes one way, okay, and the other goes the other way. And if you look at this picture in your book, or if you can see it on the screen, this is the five prime end, this is the three prime end. We just call it that. I don't really know why. Um, and then on the other side, the three prime end is up here. So they're opposite of each other. And the five prime end is up here. And they're opposite of each other. So from all this information, Watson and Crick kind of figured out that there has to be, um, specifically when you're dealing with the base pair, something has to be going on. It's uh, the structure of the bases make them attach to each other. Um, <clears throat> so each of the base pairs forms a different number of hydrogen bonds. Okay, so adenine and thymine, A and T, they both have two hydrogen bonds with each other. And then cytosine and guanine have three that form with each other. So you can see that we have our four base pairs, our four bases, A, T, C, and G, and you can see that they fit together like a puzzle, right? So adenine, 
okay? And thymine always go together. They fit together like a puzzle. They have two hydrogen bonds. Guanine and cytosine fit together like a puzzle, and they have one, two, three hydrogen bonds. So that is just something that you absolutely need to remember. A goes with T always in DNA, and G and C always go together in DNA. So at this point in the lesson, um, it's, you're going to take a pause. I'm going to continue on in the video, but this is where we're going to stop for today. So make sure that you are doing your chapter summaries um, and then continue to watch the video for the next part of the lesson. So um, many proteins work together um, in DNA replication and repair. That's concept 16.2. Uh, this is the relationship between DNA structure and how it works, okay, and then this is why it's a double helix. So we said in the last part of the lesson that DNA is made of two strands, two complementary strands that run anti-parallel to each other, and they are complementary to each other, and that just means that they one half and the other half fit together like a puzzle. They complement each other. Because A's and T's go together and C's and G's go together. So if you take apart those two strands, each of the strands acts like a new template for building a new strand in DNA replication. So in DNA replication, so this is what we call the parent strand or the strand that we start out with this picture on the left here, um, they separate. So we have side one over here, side two over here, they separate. You can see that A and T go together, C and G fit together, and so on. So when we need to make more DNA for mitosis or meiosis, okay, for cell division, um, the two brand new strands are just built by snapping new base pairs into place. So basically what happens is, is DNA opens up. Okay, it opens up, it unzips using this molecule, using this enzyme called helicase. The two sides separate. And then what happens is there's free-floating nucleotides, and remember a nucleotide is a sugar, a phosphate, and a nitrogenous base put together. They come in and they snap into place, just like a puzzle. So the dark blue is the parent strand, the light blue is the, the new strand, and they're just going to come in. So A goes with T here, C goes with G, and they just fit together. And then it makes sense, because the old strands form a template for the new strands, that we have two brand new strands of DNA, and they're exactly the same as the first. And they're exactly the same as each other. So this is how new DNA is made. It's really easy. DNA just opens up. Free-floating nucleotides that are just kind of hanging around in the cell in the nucleus come in and snap into place. So this is called semi-conservative or the semi-conservative molecule. Basically, which means each of the two new daughter DNA molecules will have one old strand okay, and one new strand. Well, that makes sense because we opened it up okay, and then we had the two halves and then the new strand was made from the old strand. So that's all semi-conservative means, is one half of it is old, one half of it is new. Okay, so um, <clears throat> there was an experiment performed by these scientists called Messelson and Stahl, and they supported the semi-conservative model of DNA replication. Okay, so um, basically what they did was they worked with E. coli bacteria for several generations, um, and then they worked with this stuff, this medium, okay, this stuff in this um, beaker here, and it had nucleotides, the things that made nucleotides, uh, with a heavy isotope of nitrogen. And the bacteria incorporated the heavy nitrogen into their DNA, okay, so they saw the bacteria that had the nitrogen in it, the isotope of it, the brand new DNA strands had it with them, um, and they could tell that. So they were like, oh, okay, so we basically marked the little nucleotides uh, with this isotope of nitrogen and saw that it was incorporated into our new DNA. Okay, so DNA replication. Well, 
this word should not be confusing to you because we all know that replication or to replicate something means to make a copy of or to make more of. So in DNA replication, you're making more of, well, DNA, okay? And DNA replication is really, really quick. There's a whole bunch of enzymes and proteins that work together that help make more DNA. So um, the replication of a DNA molecule begins at sites uh, called the origin of replication, where the two strands are separated. So that makes sense. Origin of replication is where replication starts, and that's where the two strands separate. So you can see in this picture, it doesn't happen directly at the end of DNA. So this weird strand looking thing here is actually DNA. And then a bubble forms. This is called the origin of replication or where replication is going to start. So the dark line on the outside is the old strand of DNA. The light blue on the inside is the new strand. And it kind of opens up like a zipper um, and the bubbles meet together to make new DNA strands. So, um, elongation of new DNA at the replication fork. So the replication fork is just where replication is happening. That's all it is. I don't know why they have to give it a fancy name, but wherever there is DNA separating and new nucleotides go in there, that's the replication fork, okay? Um, so keeping replication moving is catalyzed or continued on by enzymes that are called DNA polymerases. And basically what DNA polymerases do is they add nucleotides to the three prime end Okay, remember we had just had the different ends of each of the growing strands. So here's a free-floating nucleotide. It's snapping into place, um, and then the DNA polymerases, the enzymes are helping that go along. So we talked about that word anti-parallel um, in the last part of the lesson, and like I said, if it's confusing to you because people last year didn't like that word, um, please make sure you look it up. Um, so how does its anti-parallel structure help um, affect how the double helix is actually replicating? So DNA polymerases, which are those enzymes that help DNA replication, they add nucleotides. Um, so DNA polymerases add nucleotides only to the free three prime end of the growing strand. Um, along one of the template strands of DNA is called the leading strand. So this enzyme called DNA polymerase 3 makes or synthesizes a complementary strand continuously, and then the enzyme just moves along the replication fork or where the DNA is splitting. So to continue or elongating or making the other strand of DNA is called the lagging strand. So the strand that is getting stuff added to it directly is the leading strand, and the other one is called the lagging strand. Um, in the lagging strand, DNA polymerase has to work in the direction away from the replication fork, okay? So the replication fork is where the DNA is actually splitting, and then the lagging strand, um, you're working away from it, okay? The lagging strand is made um, in a series of segments called Okazaki fragments, which are joined together by a DNA ligase, okay? So, this picture should help you, okay, so the, this is DNA, the dark part is the original, uh, the original strand, okay, um, <clears throat> this is the leading strand over here, um, and the lagging strand, all right, so the Okazaki fragments, which are, seriously, they're just things, proteins that are there to help, um, make more DNA, okay? Uh, they are coming in and they are adding more segments. So the DNA polymerase is adding nucleotides and making sure that they are going on, and then the Okazaki fragments, which are similar to that, are adding it onto the lagging strand. So DNA polymerases can't start synthesis, um, they can't start this whole process, okay? DNA polymerase, they're only there to help. All they can do is add on nucleotides, okay? They can't start it, all right? So the initial nucleotide strand, the initial thing that gets added on, is RNA or a DNA primer, 
okay? So DNA polymerase can only attach different nucleotides, but the primer is what starts this whole process up. So only one primer is needed for the synthesis of the le leading strand, and the leading strand is the one where the RNA polymerase adds more nucleotides. The lagging strand is where the ok Okazaki fragments are added, okay? Um, only one primer is needed to make the leading strand, okay, and the primer is just the enzyme that starts it. But for the lagging strand, every single Okazaki fragment has to be started on its own separately. Okay. So here is the template strand. So this is DNA. And what's going to come in as the RNA primer is going to start it. Okay, it's going to be like, oh, hey, we need to put some more nucleotides in here. This is for the Okazaki. This is the lagging strand. We need to put some more nucleotides in here so we can make some more DNA. Um, so there's a primer and then the Okazaki fragment comes in and attaches these and then we have another primer and then it continues um, on in the direction of replication. I guess I should have done that first. So um, there are other proteins that assist in DNA replication. We have helicase, topoisomerase, and then single-stranded binding proteins. And these are all the proteins that help DNA replication. I highly suggest that you copy this table down in your um, notes in your chapter summaries, okay? Um, but helicase, we mentioned that at the beginning of this lesson. Helicase basically is what opens up DNA at the replication fork, okay? Uh, if you can see the word hela in there, it's helicase, it unwinds the helix. Okay, single-stranded binding proteins binds to the single-stranded DNA until it can be used as a template. So basically it sits there until it's ready. Topoisomerase uh, corrects overwinding of the DNA um, in making sure that it doesn't get wound up too much. Um, and then there are other proteins that are at the bottom here, um, but these basically are the most important. Okay, so this picture is basically a summary of everything that we talked about. It looks a little bit confusing, um, but I'm going to try and talk you through it. So <clears throat> for step number one, we have helicase, which is this green little blob protein here. It unwinds the DNA, it opens it up at the replication fork. And you guys can see the replication fork is literally where it forks um, and spreads apart. Okay, so in step number two, this little gray protein's right here is the single stranded binding protein. Um, make sure that it doesn't get wound up too much and that the DNA is open and ready to accept the new nucleotides. Step number three is using DNA polymerase 3 right here with the orange and it is helping add um, new nucleotides to the leading strand. Step number four on the lagging strand right here, um, there's a primase protein that helps add the Okazaki fragments um, on the lagging strand at the bottom. And the fifth protein here DNA polymerase 3 is uh, completing making an, a different fragment, okay, um, so adding, adding the nucleotides. DNA polymerase 1, number 6, uh, removes the primer from the 5' prime end, um, and then DNA 7 is the DNA ligase, which basically clamps on those fragments to the lagging strand. Um, please look at this picture in your book. Please read what it says um, so that you can understand the purpose because all of this is going on like simultaneously and it's a lot. So make sure that you're actually looking at this and reading um, what the different proteins are doing. So um, there are various proteins that participate in DNA replication and this all happens at once. Like I said, it's like a machine. So the DNA replication machine um, is stationary during the replication process. So DNA polymerases proofread 
the newly made DNA to make sure there's no mistakes. Um, and any mistake or any change in DNA is called a mutation. Um, <clears throat> and then in if there's a repair of DNA that needs to be made, there are enzymes that actually go in there and they're like, oh, hey, this A and this G don't go together. And these enzymes actually make repairs. So let's say the polymerase finds a mistake. Oh, crap. This C and this A, they don't fit. So what happens is, is these enzymes go in, okay, cut out and replace the damaged piece of DNA, and then they fix it. Okay, they use the ligase to bind it on there, the, that protein, the ligase. Um, and then they fix it. So most of the time when there are mistakes in DNA, it gets caught. The problem is, is when the mistakes don't get caught, then we get mutations and it causes things like cancer and so forth. Um, so the ends of our DNA actually can get shorter with each round of replication. Uh, it's just something that happens because we don't really start replication at the end, um, but it can actually cause our DNA strands to get shorter. So um, all eukaryotes, which, you know, we all know eukaryotes are organisms that have n nuclei in our cells. Um, at the end of our nucleotide sequences, at the end of our DNA, we have these things called telomeres that basically stop our DNA um, from eroding or stop them from getting shorter uh, at the end of our DNA mole molecules. So if chromosomes of the germ cells, which are just cells that are important for um, the beginning stages of life, if they became shorter in every cycle, genes would eventually be become missing. So if you think about it, we make new DNA all the time. Our cells go through mitosis all the time. And if there wasn't something to stop the DNA from getting shorter and cut off every time, we would be missing important genes. Um, so the enzyme that helps stop this process is called telomerase, um, which makes sense because they're on telomeres, which is the end of our chromosomes. And it basically starts catalyzing, lengthening the telomeres in our cells, um, especially when in our germ cells, which is just the, the first few cells of being an uh, organism. Okay, so um, that is the end of chapter 16. Please make sure that you do your uh, chapter summary and that um, you go through this as many times as you need to. Um, send me an email if you have any questions uh, and I hope we're all good with it.